As Rick said, tonight's Ed, tonight's Dan Hooper. Dan's the head of theoretical astrophysics at Fermilab and a professor of astronomy and astrophysics at the University of Chicago. His research focuses on the interface between particle physics and cosmology, and especially in the topic of dark matter. He's the author of several books, including At the Edge of Time, Exploring the Mysteries of Our Universe's First Seconds. He is also co-host of a podcast, Why This Universe? Tonight, his topic title is At the Edge of Time, Exploring Our Universe's First Seconds. A little about it. Um, over the past few decades, we have made incredible discoveries about how our cosmos evolved over the past 13.8 billion years. But there remains a critical gap in our knowledge we still know very little about. What happened in the first seconds after the Big Bang? Dan will examine how physicists are using the Large Hadron Collider and other experiments to recreate the conditions of the Big Bang and to address mysteries such as how our universe came to contain so much matter and so little antimatter. Please welcome Dan Hooper. So, so here's what I like about being a cosmologist. For as long as there have been human beings, they've looked up the night sky, and they've asked themselves questions about our universe, how it works, how it came to be. I'm just like they are. Since I was a kid, I looked up at the night sky and asked the same sort of questions. But there's a, one really important difference about people doing this today and people having done it for the last few hundred thousand years, and that's that we live at a very special time where for the first time we can credibly say we have an answer to those kinds of questions. Maybe not a complete answer, but for the most part, we have a pretty good idea of what we're looking at when we look at the night sky. And we have a pretty good idea how it got there. Take this for example, I bet um, being astronomers, uh, most of you can recognize the Hubble Deep Field image. Okay, it's one of my favorite pictures in all of science, including astronomy. So these blobs, those little blobs of light, they're not stars, I mean a couple of them are, but mostly they're galaxies. Comparable in size and shape to our own Milky Way. Um, it suggests that there are about a trillion or so galaxies in the observable volume of the universe, a trillion. And because it takes time for light to travel across space, these images, this image doesn't show us what these galaxies are like today but rather what they were like more than 13 billion years ago, only a couple of hundred million years after the Big Bang. And we can say with a lot of credibility and a lot of support, a lot of data behind it, that we understand what the universe was like at that time and how it's changed and evolved since into the, the world we find ourselves living in today. But furthermore, the universe was very, very different when we looked at it in this state. It was much, much smaller. The volume of space was, had not expanded nearly as much by then. And it was much denser as a result, and it was much hotter. And we do really understand how this happened. Of course, we couldn't understand this until relatively recently in scientific history. If you asked a physicist a little over 100 years ago, how could the universe have changed or evolved, or how could the universe have begun, or things like this, they would have looked at you like, that's a ridiculous question to be asking a scientist. Science doesn't answer questions like that. Um, to them, they thought of space, which after all is what the universe is, is a big chunk of space, they thought of space as just a static backdrop. It didn't do things. It didn't evolve, it didn't begin. You couldn't use verbs to describe space. But this guy came along and he showed us that in fact, <clears throat> verbs do act on space. Okay, so Albert Einstein, General Relativity, 1915. He teaches us that Space not only can do things, it does things. It warps, it curves, it expands, it contracts. All of those things that we thought about space, and for that matter, time before Einstein, were thrown out the window, and we had an entirely new way of thinking about our universe. And among other things that taught us, 
If you use the equations of his theory, this shows that space can't stay the same. It really has to either expand or contract with time. And that means our universe was different in the past than it is today. And that opened up the possibility to talk about the evolution of our universe and maybe even the beginning of our universe. So everyone in this room has heard before that the universe is expanding. But if you're like most people, you don't really have a good intuitive idea of what that is, what that means, what it's all about. So I'm going to try to explain it in simple terms. So when Edwin Hubble in 1929 pointed the Mount Wilson telescope at various galaxies and later reported that our universe is expanding, what he meant, what he actually saw, is that all the galaxies he could point his telescope at were moving away from us. Furthermore, the farther away a galaxy is from us, the faster it's moving away from us, the faster it's receding. And what this really means is that if you take any two points in space, the distance between them is getting bigger as time goes on. That's what we mean when we say our universe is expanding. So let me guess, how many of you are thinking to yourself right now, what is space expanding into? Yeah, okay. I've done this enough times. It, it, every single time I give a talk, that's, that's on half the people in the room's mind. So it sounds like a reasonable question, right? I'm telling you space expanding, and you want to know what's it expanding into. If it was expanding into something, what would we call that something? Space. Space. That's not what we mean, okay? When I say space is expanding, I don't mean stuff in space is moving into some previously unoccupied thing. <coughs> I mean space. I mean all of space, the entirety of it, the volume of it is growing with time. And that doesn't mean it's not going into something else. It's just a matter of every, all, all of the volume of space is getting bigger with time. And that means all of the points in space are getting farther apart from one another. So I came up with a, a, like a mental trick when I was in grad school to understand this, because I struggled with it, as almost everybody who encounters this idea does, if they're honest. <laughs> Not all of us are. But here's a trick I came up with. Imagine we're sitting in this room right now, as we are actually, and I measure the size of the room. So I take like a meter stick, and I lay it you know, side by side down, one after the other, and I find out that this is, I don't know, let's say 10 meters from side to side. And now I wait a while and I repeat the measurement. But this time I find it's 11 meter six long. There are two ways I can interpret this data. I can say, ah, the room is getting bigger with time at a rate of one meter per however long it took between the two measurements. But what's the other way I could interpret that if I chose to? Maybe the meter stick is shrinking. Okay, Both of those are empirically valid ways to interpret what I've just told you. So how would we find out which is true? Well, I could compare the meter stick to a bunch of other objects and see if they're shrinking relative to it or growing relative to it, things like this. But maybe the room is getting bigger or maybe everything in the room is getting smaller together in unison. So when a cosmologist says the universe is expanding, you could equally well think of this as everything in the universe as shrinking, including constants of nature like the size of atoms and the speed of light. But if all of that's shrinking in unison, it would look just like the universe is expanding. Now, I'm not trying to tell you that's what's actually going on, but if you have a hard time picturing the volume of space getting bigger without it getting expanding into something, just tell your brain instead to think about all the stuff getting smaller. All the stars, planets, photons of light, atoms, all everything together. Okay, let's keep going. So the fact that our universe is getting bigger, the volume of space is growing, allows us to say something about what the distant past of our universe was like. After all, if you take the matter that's in our universe, you measure its density, if the volume was smaller in the past, then the density must have been higher in the past. The, pa the, the distant past of our universe was a higher density, and it turns out higher temperature configuration of matter and energy. So if you extrapolate this, these equations backwards, if you take Einstein's equations and the measurements of our universe expanding and work your way back, you reach a point billions of years ago where the universe was substantially smaller 
substantially more dense and substantially hotter. And that's what we mean when we talk about the Big Bang. We're talking about the hot, dense state that our universe emerged from, uh, as it turns out, 13.8 billion years ago. When you think about the Big Bang, you might be tempted to picture some sort of explosion. Okay, That's how most people describe it. But this can be a misleading way to think about it. In particular, the Big Bang didn't happen at some particular place in space. Like, you know, some explosion taking place that we might be familiar with, you can tell me what coordinates it happened at this location at this time. That's not the Big Bang. When I talk about the Big Bang, I'm talking about a state the entire universe was in 13.8 billion years ago, including right where we are now. All of the universe, all of space, every last corner of it was filled with an ultra-dense, ultra-hot plasma of particles, matter, and energy. That's the state we call the Big Bang. And as the universe expanded and cooled, um, it turned into the universe we see around us today. So let's take a bit of a tour through cosmic history. Okay, This is a timeline. Cosmologists love timelines. Here we are, 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang. If we go back here you can see uh, the point a couple of hundred million years after the Big Bang where the first stars formed. We still never really seen a picture of this, but we think with the, the JWST telescope, which deployed, uh, I don't know, six months ago or something, that we'll soon have the first pictures of those first stars, so keep your eyes open for that. In fact, I think the first JW, JWST images for the public are going to become available in the weeks ahead, so something to look forward to. So about I don't know, eight or nine billion years later, the sun and our solar system planets form in you know, all of human histories in that little speck there. This is a perfectly reasonable way in some certain ways to present our cosmic history. It, it's certainly correct, but I don't care for it much and most cosmologists don't either because all the stuff that I think is the most interesting happened like in a tiny little pixel there. <laughs> so I prefer to look at this on a logarithmic scale instead. The same thing, but now in powers of 10 here, okay? So the same first stars, the same formation of the solar system. Um, and it turns out that our universe today is filled with a very, very cold bath of radiation. Okay, it's about 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. And as you go backwards in time, as the universe gets smaller and hotter, that radiation still existed, but it was much hotter. So when the first stars were forming a couple hundred million years after the Big Bang, the, this radiation was about 50 degrees above absolute zero, so still very, very cold, but hotter. If you go back to here, about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, you reach a point where the entire universe was filled with a background of radiation at about 3,000 degrees. So this is hot, right? This is like the temperature of the surface of a red star, to give you a, a point of reference. and Again, this wasn't a state that certain places in the universe were in. It's the whole universe, all of space. Every little last quarter of it was filled with a plasma of 3,000 degree electrons, protons, and photons. This isn't just any old temperature either. It's a very special temperature, at least to cosmologists. Um, it's special because it's about the temperature where atoms will begin to melt. So I don't mean the way that ice melts or something like this. That, that doesn't transform atoms. It just transforms the way they kind of stick together and interact among themselves. I'm talking about atoms themselves. So if I take a bunch of atoms, let's say, and I put them in a box and I start heating that box, right around 3,000 degrees, their electrons are going to start breaking off, disassociating from those atoms. So you're transforming your gas of atoms into a plasma of electrically charged nuclei, protons, and electrons. Neutral atoms, like intact atoms, can only exist at temperatures below about 3,000 degrees, or basically on this side of the line. <coughs> so that means that this moment in cosmic history, around 380,000 years after the Big Bang, all of the universe transitioned from this state of a charged plasma of electrons, protons, and other nuclei to a state 
of electrically neutral atoms, the first atoms formed. And it turns out that if you have a plasma, light can't penetrate it. Okay, so for the same reason I can't like look through the sun, light couldn't travel through the universe before this point in time. It was opaque. It was like trying to look through a wall. So we reach this point, suddenly these atoms form, and the universe stops being opaque for the first time and becomes transparent to light. And all that light just starts going in straight lines in all directions. That light is still in our universe today. We're all being bathed in it right now. We call it the cosmic microwave background. There are about 400 and change photons from that background in every cubic centimeter of space in the universe today. We're all bathed in it right now. That's that 2.7 degree background radiation it was left over, is liberated into the universe 380,000 years after the Big Bang, and it persists today. So, I'm a scientist, and if you tell me something like this, I might, I might be open-minded to it being true, but to convince me that it's true, you're gonna have to present me with some pretty compelling evidence, something based in solid empirical reasoning. And you might think that because I'm claiming this happened, you know, almost 13.8 billion years ago, that no such evidence would be forthcoming. This sounds like a hard thing to measure, but it's not. I mean, it's kind of hard, but certainly been done. <laughs> this is a picture of that radiation on the whole sky. This is the cosmic microwave background as measured by the Planck satellite. It's our finest uh, cosmic microwave background image we've uh, produced so far. What this is, is that 2.7 degree radiation background we see in the sky. The red points are just slightly hotter than average by about one part in uh, 100,000. The blue parts are the coldest um, parts, uh, again, colder by about one part in 100,000. And by measuring the detailed pattern of temperature variations on the sky, we can not only confirm that our universe really did undergo this transition 380,000 years after the Big Bang, as we predicted it, it, it should have happened, but we can measure a lot of detailed properties of our universe in that, at that time, like how the matter and energy were distributed, what kinds of matter and energy were present. And we can also measure things, determine things about how our universe has expanded and evolved ever since. We can even use this map to determine the large scale geometry of our universe. Okay. All these things are possible through this data set. It's a true treasure trove to cosmologists. Let's go back to our timeline. All right, so I've extended a bit here. We've gone back to the first stars, the first atoms, and now I'm gonna go way back here to when the first nuclei formed. This is in the first minutes and seconds after the Big Bang. Um, and at this point, the universe was filled with this plasma of about a billion degree heat and radiation, okay? A billion degrees. So this is, you know, 100 times hotter than the core of the sun. So you should think of the whole universe at that point, every last corner of it, being basically a giant nuclear fusion reactor. Everywhere, throughout all space. And during that time, you could do things like this sort of process. This is something you'll find in a, in like a nuclear physics textbook or something, but uh, you can take protons and neutrons, fuse them together in deuterium, maybe combine them with a neutron to make some tritium, and then you know make up some helium nuclei or something. And this went on super, super efficiently. This is something kind of similar to this happens in the sun, but it happens over billions of years. Because our universe contains so many free neutrons, this happened much, much more efficiently in the early universe, taking about a quarter of all the protons and neutrons that existed and fusing them together into helium nuclei in only a few minutes time. Again, I'm a scientist, and if you want to convince me this really happened, you're going to have to provide me some evidence. But it turns out we can measure how much helium and how much deuterium and how much lithium and how much beryllium, et cetera, there is in the universe today, and it matches the predictions of this theory very, very accurately. So it leaves us pretty convinced that we understand how our universe evolved from about, uh, say, a second or so after the Big Bang up till the present. There could have been some slight departures from our standard picture, but more or less, the stuff you find in a cosmology textbook from one second on 
has been empirically or observationally confirmed. Going back, so we've got first stars, first atoms, first nuclei. Let's go back to here. Okay, so this is a millionth of a second or so after the Big Bang. The temperature is about 10 trillion degrees, and it was around this point that the first protons and neutrons were forming. Protons and neutrons, it turns out, are made of smaller fundamental particles we call quarks. And those quarks are held together by other particles called gluons. At higher temperatures, so back here, those particles were all, all free. You know, protons and neutrons would have all melted apart into quarks. But around this time, those quarks started to bind together to make the first uh, stable protons and neutrons. So this whole part of the story I told you we had good empirical or observational evidence for. We measured things that tell us that really happened. We don't really have any way of directly measuring this transition. We run our equations back, backwards, and they seem to suggest this should have happened, but we don't have any way yet of making measurements that confirm that. But we do have indirect means of probing this era by trying to recreate the sorts of conditions that existed then and study the laws of physics that dictated that era of our universe's history. To do that, we use these incredible machines called particle accelerators. And currently, they get us back to roughly uh, you know, a trillionth or so of a second after the Big Bang. This is the world's premier particle accelerator right now. It's called the Large Hadron Collider, or LHC. And it's basically a big 17-mile circumference ring or tunnel underneath the city of Geneva, Switzerland, and it kind of goes over the border into France. Around that ring, there are these tunnels, and, and, the, and throughout the tunnel, there are really powerful, almost futuristic magnets that propel protons around that ring. Um, those protons get moving almost the speed of light, 99.999997% of the speed of light. That's a lot of nines, just an enormous, uh, amount of energy carried by individual particles, um, traveling in huge numbers um, constantly around this ring. Then, at designated collision points, two beams of protons are collided head-on into one another inside of these particle detectors. So you can't, this doesn't really do, picture, uh, do it justice, picture doesn't do it justice. This is like the size of a gymnasium, this thing. And it's just full of incredible 21st century electronics and devices. And every time a collision takes place in the heart of this thing, particles go out in all directions and the, in real time uh, makes sense of those collisions and tries to work out what happened. And this is not like something we do once. Um, I saw that, that silly uh, Angels and Demons movie and like they turn on the Large Hadron Collider and like a collision happens like, oh, we're done. <laughs> they collide about something like 600 million collisions a second. In each one of those, they have to record all this data and try to figure out what happened in real time. So this is an incredibly incredible project by any stretch of the imagination. So why are we doing this? Why are we colliding all these particles together? It doesn't seem like a very good way to learn about the laws of physics. If I want to learn about auto mechanics, I don't just take my car and drive it into something as fast as I can. That would not be a very, very good approach. But it turns out that this is the best way we have to understand the fundamental constituents of matter and energy and the laws that dictate their behavior. And it really just boils down, well, among other things, it boils down to Einstein's most famous equation, e equals mc squared. Basically, all that says is that mass is just one kind of energy. It's kind of a storage battery of energy, if you will. And if you can get enough energy in one place at one time, that energy can, in principle, be converted into exotic forms of matter with a lot of mass. So for example, uh, the Large Hadron Collider discovered in 2012 a new particle that we had long expected existed but hadn't seen any evidence of called the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson's of, like 130 or 140 times as heavy as a proton. So to make a Higgs boson, you need to collide protons together with a huge amount of energy and have some of that energy be converted into the mass of the Higgs boson. We do this not just with the Higgs boson, but all of the known fundamental particles. And this is all of them we know of so far. Um, six of these particles are called quarks. 
The up and down quarks are the sort of quarks that make up protons and neutrons, but they're these other more exotic ones. The top quark is the heaviest or most massive known particle. It was discovered at Fermilab back in the, the mid-90s. Uh, down here we have the, what we call the leptons. That includes the electron and its heavier and unstable cousins, the muon and tau lepton. It also includes these three very feebly interacting particles called neutrinos. Over here we have the particles that bring the forces of nature into, into effect. Uh, that includes the photon and gluon, these things called the W and Z bosons, and then of course the most famous recent discovery, the Higgs. So you might be, uh, you, you could be excused if at this point in the lecture you, you think what I'm trying to tell you is that we have this all worked out, okay? I've given you a very, uh, I'm trying to be bullish on the, on the, the progress in cosmology, and, and in a lot of ways that's true, okay? But in some ways it's very much not. Sure, we have a spectacularly successful theory. When we take what Einstein taught us about space and time and gravity and combine it with all the stuff we've learned from particle accelerators, we can explain <coughs> basically everything we see about our universe's history from a second forward, maybe even earlier. And we can make detailed predictions and those predictions have turned out to basically be right on, okay? With a couple exceptions. If you told some, some physicists 50 or 100 years ago that cosmology was gonna get this mature and be able to make this, these sorts of claims and support them to a point of scientific consensus, I think they would have laughed you out of the room. But we've done it, it's happened. We understand these things. At the same time, there are a number of open questions or puzzles, conundrums, maybe loose ends that have been nagging at us for quite some time. And I, for one, am not so sure we have it all wrapped up. Okay. Um, maybe we're just gonna keep working on these open puzzles and some years or decades from now, we'll, we'll figure out how to resolve them all in, in, within the context of the existing paradigm, and, and they really will just be loose ends that we hadn't quite tied up yet. But all the loose ends I'm gonna describe for you, they all kind of point at something being different than we understand about this first, say, millionth of a second after the Big Bang. Maybe the, the, that first moment of time was very, very different than we currently think. <coughs> Maybe stuff happened, maybe transitions took place, maybe forms of energy existed. Who knows? Stuff we haven't thought of yet was all different and all exotic compared to our current way of thinking. Maybe we need a new paradigm to understand the first instance of cosmic history. So let me go through some of these puzzles and give you an idea of what I'm talking about. The first, I'm gonna talk about four puzzles. The first one I wanna talk about has to do with the fact that matter exists at all in our universe. <laughs> When we take all the information we get from particle accelerators and other experiments, we find that for every form of matter that exists, there exists a, a counterpart that we call antimatter. Okay, so the electron, for example, comes along with an antimatter counterpart called the positron. The electron has a negative electric charge, the positron has a positive electric charge. But other than that, they're very similar particles. They have the same mass, they basically behave the same way, but they're kind of the opposite versions of each other. Similarly, quarks have anti-quarks, um, neutrinos have anti-neutrinos, -neutri uh, protons have anti-protons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. As far as we can tell, universe, the, every, every form of matter and energy that exists comes along with like a mirror image version of it in antimatter. And also, best we can tell, every time you create or destroy matter, you have to create and, and destroy, create or destroy an equal amount of antimatter along with it. Their fates are closely intertwined. So for example, I, I can create an electron for you in the lab, but I can only do it if I create a positron along with it. And I can destroy an electron in the lab, but I have to destroy a positron with it. I, I can't destroy or create an electron without destroying or creating a positron in conjunction with it. So this is all great. If you're a particle physicist, that's just, we all know that to be true and that's not a problem. But if you're a cosmologist, this is a real problem. After all, the Big Bang should have included equal amounts of matter and antimatter. And as the universe expanded and cooled, that should have stayed the same. There sh I mean, maybe most of that would have been destroyed, but in the end, you'd have the same amount of matter 
in the universe as you have antimatter. And you may have noticed, but our universe has a lot of matter, but not very much antimatter in it. So how we transitioned from an early state, which had equal amounts of matter and antimatter, to one at some later time with much more matter than antimatter remains a total mystery. We do not have an answer for it. Um, well, actually, to be more correct, we have lots and lots of answers, and we just don't know which one's right. Okay, so like I've written papers proposing new ways to have done this. So have you know my thousand favorite you know cosmologist friends, um, and we just don't know which, if any of them, are the right guess or something close to the right guess. The second puzzle I want to talk about also has to do with matter, but not the kind of matter that we see in our universe with our eyes. Like is, is uh, provides the gravity that holds galaxies together. And all we can really say about it for sure is it doesn't seem to appreciably reflect, radiate, or absorb light. Maybe it does at some level, but not at a level we've been able to detect yet. So back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, astronomers got really good at looking at galaxies and measuring the, the dynamics of them, like measuring how the stars and gas and stuff moved in these systems over time. And they thought they knew what they were going to expect. What they thought they would see was something like this. So this is a, a galactic rotation curve. So this tells you how fast a star should be moving in, a, in its orbit around the center of its host galaxy as a function of how far it is from the galactic center. So once you got kind of out from the center, it should drop off you know, pretty distinctively. And this is for the same reason why Pluto moves more slowly around the sun than the Earth does. Just farther, farther away from the mass, you can stay in a circular orbit in a stable way, but just moving more slowly. This is what everyone expected these astronomers to observe, but galaxy after galaxy after galaxy, people like Bear Rubin and Kent Ford and others saw lines that look like this. They look pretty flat, okay? These flat rotation curves are perplexing, but what they seem to suggest was two things. First of all, there's way more gravity in these systems than they were expecting. There's something tugging on these stars and on this gas gravitationally that isn't the normal stars, gas, and dust that you can see with your telescope. Something invisible was acting on them. And also the fact that, that, that this, this is so flat tells you that it's distributed in a different way. It's way bigger and puffier than the visible parts of galaxies. The visible parts of galaxies are kind of small and compact, and then the dark matter extends out 10 times as far. And whereas many galaxies like our own or Andromeda or something take a disc-like shape, the dark matter seems to be distributed in a big, puffy, spherical, or roughly spherical halo. Okay. Another thing about dark matter, which began to really uh, be influential in the 1980s, was the realization that if the early universe contained a big gas of basically non-interacting, slow-moving particles, dark matter particles, you could put this stuff on a computer and just see in an expanding universe how they would kind of cluster under gravity or how they would behave under gravity. And here's like a bunch of sh uh, like time-lapse images of one of these simulations. You start out with something pretty uniform, and then as time goes on, it clumps and clusters more and more and more until you get to the present day. And it turns out that picture looks just like the distribution of galaxies in our universe, at least statistically. So, it turns out that if you didn't have a lot of dark matter in our universe, you couldn't explain what you see in our universe today, the distribution of galaxies and clusters of galaxies. We can only make sense of that if our universe contains a lot more dark matter than normal atomic matter. What we really want to know, what I really want to know, is probably the thing I spend most of my waking hours thinking about, is what the dark matter is, not just how it's affected things astrophysically, but deep down, what is this stuff? What particles make it up? We don't know the answer to that yet, but that's not for a lack of trying, and we haven't given up. This is uh, a laboratory um, under the Gran Sasso uh, Mountains in, uh, in Italy, the Gran Sasso National Laboratory. And in this laboratory, there are a bunch of dark matter ex experiments. These are not entirely, but most, most of these are dark matter experiments. 
Um, they're basically designed to detect dark matter particles that can penetrate deep into the earth and scatter off their, their, their targets. Um, I'll draw your attention specifically to the xenon. The modern version of the xenon experiment is supposed to have brand new results maybe next week. Mm -hmm. So you'll probably see stuff in the news about it. The uh, North American counterpart of xenon called uh, the Lux Zeppelin or LZ collaboration is going to have their first results on Thursday. So it's a big week for dark matter. So keep, keep your eyes peeled on that. If we're a little lucky, maybe a lot lucky, we'll see the first indications of what these particles are that make up the dark matter and start to measure their characteristics. If I'm being honest, what's more likely is they'll just tell us, well, they interact even less than we thought. And they'll have a new constraint. And we'll be able to rule out some of our best theories, but others will survive. That's usually what happens. <laughs> I've grown to be a pessimist <laughs> over the last 20 years. Of All right, so those are the first two puzzles. Let's talk about the third puzzle. This doesn't have to do with matter, either dark or otherwise. This third puzzle has to do with how fast our universe has been expanding over time. So if I take Einstein's equations, and you tell me that the universe is expanding now, there are really three possibilities for how it might have played out over different times. It could be that our universe is, gonna, is expanding now and it's going to keep expanding without limit. It could be that it's expanding now and it's going to kind of plateau to a fixed size eventually. Or it could be that it's going to expand for a while, reach a maximum size, and then start to contract, undergoing what we call a big crunch, which is like a big bang in reverse. For a long time, cosmologists thought these were the three cases. We just have to measure which one we are. Okay. And they worked really hard at measuring it. And in the 1990s, they found that. <laughs> it's none of the above, something totally different. It looks like this for a while, but then a few billion years ago, it started to kind of kick into high gear. The expansion rates started accelerating. <clears throat> that was something that Einstein's equation said shouldn't have happened. All three of the possibilities we had long expected said that the universe could be expanding, but it should be decelerating. And that's not what we've observed. We don't know why the universe is, is, is acceleration rate is expanding, but it seems to require that throughout all of the universe there's some sort of form of energy that doesn't dilute as the universe expands. Okay? And this drives the universe to get bigger with time. So Imagine I have a cubic meter of space, and I have some stuff in it, some matter, whatever, atoms, dark matter, whatever, and then that space grows, expands, so now it's two cubic meters. Well, as that happens, you know, the density of that matter goes down by a factor of two. Whatever it started out at is half as dense when you're done. But to explain the sort of accelerating expansion, you need something else in there, too. Maybe something just built into the fabric of space and time that as, it, as the volume of that space doubles, the total amount of this weird exotic energy doubles as well. The density stays fixed. We don't know what the stuff is again, but we call it dark energy. It's super perplexing why it exists in the quantity it does, or the abundance it does. And um, just a few billion years ago, it seems to have started to be the main source of energy or the main constituent of energy in our universe. And it's been since that time, it's been driving our universe to grow faster than Einstein's equations would have otherwise predicted. Which brings us to the fourth and final of my conundrums, my puzzles, my loose ends, which might be closely connected with that of dark energy. We don't know. Turns out that our universe is really surprisingly flat, by which I mean if you draw triangles across the universe and add up their angles, they are 180 degrees and things like um, the ratio of the diameter and circumference of big cosmological sized circles is pi. And all the stuff you learned in ninth or 10th grade geometry or whatever, that seems to apply to our universe. That's not what we expected, okay? The Big Bang Theory until at least the 1980s predicted that our universe should be curved, warped, not flat. But it is flat. It's flat to the best of our ability to measure. Very, very flat. Also, it's really uniform. Remember that cosmic background picture I showed you before? The hottest spots and the coldest spots in that are only one part in 10 to the 5 different from average. 
which means that you know, in the early universe, things were just really uniform. There's almost exactly the same amount of stuff everywhere. That is not what the Big Bang Theory should have led, led us to expect. To kind of patch up the Big Bang Theory, to make sense of this, physicists have invoked a hypothesis that our universe kind of went an uh, era of incredibly intense expansion in the very, very uh, tiniest fraction of a second after the Big Bang. We call this cosmic inflation. And just picture uh, uh, an era, it probably lasted 10 to the minus 32 seconds or something, so almost no time at all. But during that time, space expanded so fast that your next door neighbor particle is suddenly completely out of causal contact. You'll never see it again, okay? The space grew that, that fast. And when it was over, the, suddenly the whole universe was populated with a new hot plasma of particles and kind of the universe we know and love started at that point. If that happened, it can explain why our universe is so flat and explain why our universe is so uniform, but exactly how or why this happened, what drove it to happen, how it all played out, these are all open questions. I think most cosmologists now think that inflation probably took place, but that's about as much as we can say about it at this point. We really don't understand it. It's a big open question. One interesting thing about inflation is that if it did take place, and like I said, most cosmologists think it probably did, it should have created an infinite number of worlds, universes. As this expansion occurs, some parts of space stop inflating and leaving us with parts of space that look like our universe. But then other parts keep inflating becoming much, much bigger in volume, and then little patches of those one at a time stop inflating, making effectively new universes. This will go on forever. It's still going on, if the theory is right. And that means there should be a, a effectively infinite number of such spaces containing their own matter and energy and expanding and looking very much like our universe, or a universe anyway. So. When we look at our universe and we measure its flatness, we measure its uniformity, it turns out that seems to imply the existence of a vast multiverse, cosmic multiverse. I wouldn't say this is proven or something, but it sure is suggestive. Everything we know about it, it suggests that's maybe the answer. Okay, so let's put this all into perspective. We've got a spectacularly successful theory but it's got a few loose ends, okay? Four puzzles. Why is there so much more matter than antimatter? What's dark matter? What's dark energy and why is it there? And did inflation occur in the first fraction of a second after the Big Bang? Four, let's call them loose ends that we're surely gonna wrap up in the years or maybe decades ahead. To put this in context though, let's say you went back to 1904 and you surveyed some physicists to ask them, what do you think of the state of physics right now? They would have told you, ah, we've got this great theory, Newtonian physics, and we understand electricity, magnetism, and heat and stuff now. All this is great. We've got it all sorted out. Sure, there are a few loose ends, but this theory is solid. We're, we're gonna, this one's gonna land. Right? It's gonna last forever. Why did I pick 1904 in this version of the story? 1905 was marvelous. Yeah, 1905, Einstein comes and breaks everything we know about physics. I'm hoping we live in 1904 right now, okay, for cosmology. I'm hoping that in 2023, the next Einstein comes forth and shows us the resolution, or at least guides us down the road to the resolution of these open problems. I don't know if that's going to happen. I don't even know if I think it's likely, but I'm hopeful, okay? That's my, that's my, uh, that's what I, that would, would make me extremely <coughs> exciting. Um, that would be an extremely exciting uh, period to live through. And, and maybe it's going to happen, but it's going to happen, you know, 10 or 100 or 1,000 years from now. I don't know. But right now, I think the bottom line is we understand very well how our universe evolved from a second to the present. We have good reasons to think we can more or less reconstruct what happened in that first billionth of a second or trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. Before that, all bets are off, and there seem to be things our current thinking can't really provide us with a resolution.
All right, so we're gonna stop here and then we'll take some questions. Um, and I, but I do need to do a little bit of shameless self-promoting here. I've got a book which I brought a whole box of tonight if anybody would be interested in buying one. Um, it has the same title as this talk in it basically covers the same sort of ideas that you heard about in this talk. So you, you don't expect any big surprises in that book. It's about the stuff we're talking about here. And if you prefer more of an audio format, I co-host this podcast, Why This Universe, with uh, Shalma Wegsman. And we do every two weeks or so a uh, half an hour explainer on something we think is really cool in physics. If you're into podcasts, you can find it everywhere that you listen to podcasts. I see a question right there. Yes, Dr. Hooper, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like that not that many years ago, cosmologists didn't have a lot of theories that they come up with on why there was a predominance, why there was an excess of, of uh, matter over antimatter. Could you uh, <coughs> at least briefly describe a couple of the theories of the thousand theories or whatever? Sure, like? sure. I don't know if there's really a thousand, but there are lots. Yeah. Um, okay, so the story of matter and antimatter as an idea goes back to the late 60s. Um, uh, uh, Sakharov, uh, this Russian physicist, um, I think is it Alexei Sakharov? Andrei, Andrei Sakharov, that's it, uh, wrote this paper where he pointed out that in order for somehow our universe to have transitioned from a state with the same amount of matter and antimatter to one where matter was dominant, predominant, um, certain conditions had to be met. And they're weird conditions. They, 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 they involve violations of known laws of physics. So those have to have happened. We just don't know in what combination. And it became a kind of a mainstream cosmological topic in the 80s. And ever since the 80s, people have been brainstorming ideas, including people like me. Um, one of the ideas is that maybe there were some very massive exotic particles that formed in the early universe but fell out of equilibrium with the whole thermal, the, the whole hot bath. And after a while, those particles decayed in a way that produced more matter than antimatter, creating what we call baryons, but not antibaryons. And they had to do it in a way that, um, how do I say it? Um, not time symmetric. Uh, it wants to go one way, but not the other way. Kind of, um, that sort of thing. Um, but very exotic stuff. Another idea that um, is also popular in this context is that um, there may have been heavy particles that made and an, uh, preferentially made heavy neutrinos in the early universe, uh, but not anti-neutrinos. And then those particles interacted through, through a process we call sphaleron interactions to create the antimatter asymmetry that we observe in our universe today. Those are just a couple of the ideas, but I don't, and by the way, each of those have many, many sub ideas. So there's a very, very, very long list. I wrote a paper a couple years ago suggesting that maybe this happened because of tiny black holes that might have existed in the early universe, to give you an idea. All right, right over there. So it seems like almost all four of the problems have maybe some kind of lacking in the math. Do you think like you know Newton coming up with calculus to solve some of the issues he was facing, are we maybe gonna have to do some rethinking of our math just to explain these exotic situations that we're looking at. Yeah, I mean, math is a tool, as far as I'm concerned. Calculus was a tool for Newton or Leibniz. Um, differential geometry was a tool for Einstein. Um, I have my own toolbox of mathematical tricks, as most physicists do. Uh, string theorists use a lot of things like topology, as a branch of mathematics, and things like this. Uh, differential geometry is common. Um, maybe there'll be some kind of math that people aren't currently using, or maybe just mathematicians are using, but physicists haven't learned yet that will be important to this. Um, but I will say, generally speaking, in the history of science, the math has followed the physics. We get in, like, okay, Einstein's a good example. He started work with curved space. And, and how things would behave in that situation. He had that idea, and then to work out the details that would follow from that idea, he had to learn uh, a bunch of non-Riemannian geometry and, and kinds of math that he didn't know. Um, but the math existed, mathematicians knew about it, just Einstein didn't. 
So, um, they, but it may, you know, some of these steps might require some physicists to learn kinds of maths, math that we currently don't <coughs> implement or, or very often use or see in physics. I was thinking like quantum math, quantum calculation. I mean, we all, all physicists essentially do quantum physics, um, and there's a bunch of kinds of math to use in quantum physics, ranging from calculus to you know, linear algebra to it goes on and on and on. Um, almost any kind of math you can think of is, has applications in quantum physics. Um, whether there's some part of this that would be useful that we don't currently employ, I mean, probably, but uh, I wouldn't know where to start looking. Probably the issue. Does inflation violate the speed of light? Mm, good question. So I told you before that during cosmic inflation, as we currently imagine it, space grew, expanded so fast that particles that were next to each other quickly became totally causally disconnected, effectively in different universes. The space, the amount of space between those two particles does grow faster than the speed of light. You might think that's a problem, but the prohibition or the, the speed limit built into nature of the speed of light only says that things can't move through space faster than the speed of light. Space can do whatever it wants. Space can grow at any speed. There's no prohibition that doesn't violate Einstein's relativity or anything else. No, no principles are, are harmed in uh, space <laughs> expanding faster than the speed of light. Uh, but nothing can move through space okay. faster than that speed limit. Yeah. Take the Hubble Deep Field, if we were to see that today, or like realistic, if we were to take that 10 billion years from now, be able to take a picture of that, would that be a lot less dense or a lot less busy than it is in that photo? Or being able to see through time as we see you know, through infinity, we still have the same amount of galaxies per you know, Lincoln's eye type thing? Okay, so if, if we wait 10 billion years and our future selves try to do the Hubble Deep Field again, so all those galaxies will still be there that you well, not those, but galaxies like them, right. okay? And you can take a picture of them. They'd be a lot fainter, so you'll need a bigger telescope. And uh, they'll be more red shifted. So you're gonna, to get an optical pic, uh, picture that looks like that, you'll probably need an infrared telescope or something, okay? Uh, but with those two exceptions, you should continue to be able to do something like the Hubble Deep Film. Okay. And in to the, to, well, 10 billion years for sure. Now, if you wait even longer, though, eventually you won't be able to do that anymore because the space between us and that era of cosmic history will be expanding faster than light, and that means the light will never reach you. In the extreme limit of the future, dark energy is going to cause our universe to grow so fast that basically we won't be able to see anything outside of the local group. So the Milky Way and Andromeda and basically all, will all merge into one big super galaxy and nothing else will be visible in the night sky. So we live in a cool era. We live, yes, yeah, so, okay. It's a long era though, okay? I don't wanna give you the impression that, you know, run out and take your, use your telescopes now because it's all gonna be gone. I mean, a trillion years from now, astronomy will be very hard, okay? But um, if we make it that long, I'll we from Thursday we're still good though, right? Yeah, <laughs> we've got a while. We've got a while. <laughs> you spent a lot of time tonight pushing time back, back, slicing it closer and closer and closer. So, what are your thoughts? What there was before? Ah, what happened before the Big Bang? So, If you go back to the Big Bang idea as it was talked about before the 1970s or so, people would have told you, cosmologists would have said, that's not a question you can ask. And what they meant by that is if you take the equations, general relativity, just run them backwards, and, and the universe filled with things like ordinary matter and light and whatever, you reach a point in those equations where really time starts to come into existence, okay? And asking, according to that math, asking what happened before it is like asking where on this map is the north of the North Pole. There just isn't anything in existence that those words point to. So it, it's really a matter, it, it, so Einstein made us really rethink what space and time were. And we have this intuition that time is linear, that there's, can't be such a thing as this beginning of time, like 
stuff can come into existence at a time, and we might call that the beginning of time, but that's not what Einstein means. When Einstein or when a relativist says time began, what they really mean is that there isn't anywhere in space-time prior that has a time bigger than t equals zero, which we call the Big Bang. And I said that's what people said from the 70s earlier. With inflation, that kind of changes things. If you have a state where the universe is growing and there's exponential growth for this period of time, um, and I told you it never ends, it keeps doing this forever, at least in some parts of space, then in principle that can go on forever. And it might have no beginning. It might, the, there might have been some sort of perpetual inflation universe generating machine that <coughs> has lasted forever and will last forever into the future. I think we just don't know. I think this should be, we should be, be super open-minded about it. Um, I don't even pretend to have the faintest inkling of how we would find out or uh, what we would do with that information or what we could conclude from it if we had some sort of way to probe it. It's, it's, that's a long way off. Yeah. yeah um, similar, man. In that first very dense second, what effect would uh, time dilation due to general relativity have on the evolution of the universe? In particular, in terms of you know, if there's variations in density, right? You know, one pocket is evolving faster than the pocket next to it. Yeah. So every individual particle in that hot, dense soup um, that exists in the early universe experiences time in a different way depending on how fast it's moving, right? Um, so let's say I take some particle, I don't know, I take a muon, some particle like a muon. If, if I just take a muon and sit it there at rest, it lasts about a millionth of a second before it will decay away. That's about its half-life. But now I've got a muon, it's traveling close to the speed of light because the universe is super hot. Well, now it's not going to decay all that fast. It'll, its lifetime will be time dilated, so it can it can persist much much longer than it would um, at slow at, uh, at its normal 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 speed. So when you do these calculations, you have to like include all of these uh, you know relativistic bells and whistles um, to have a self consistent answer. You could even imagine much more exotic forms of matter that have very, very short lifetimes, but that might have lasted longer because of the effects of time dilation. So, um, yeah, it's, it's non-trivial to keep straight. I've, I've screwed up a number of calculations at various times because I forgot to uh, include that. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's something we, uh, we actively think about. So what is space? Because you speak of the fabric of space, you talk about space moving. Um, so space what exactly is space? So um, I have a very pragmatic answer to that question of what is space. It is just, it's a system we use to keep track of what's close to what, okay? So, um, and it, it, I, I can think about it in really abstract ways. Um, we notice that things that are close to each other in space tend to interact with each other a lot more than things that are far away from each other in space. So now I have a sense of what it means to be close or far <coughs> away, for a distance to be small or large. And uh, to quantify that, we invent something called a metric. Okay, So in ordinary pre-Einstein flat space, the metric was just, well, how far, you know, the x coordinate difference squared plus the y coordinate distance squared plus the z coordinate distance squared. I'll square to whole that gives you basically three dimensional Pythagorean theorem tells you the distance between any two points in space. Einstein tells it a little more complicated. First of all, all those lines can be warped or curved, so you have to do that. But also, time and space aren't separable in the way that we are. Our intuition leads us to believe. So you need to have a metric not in space, but in space time. Okay. But really what it boils down to is we want to be able to have some sort of grid of coordinates, four dimensions in this case, not three, with uh, rules that tell us how things are going to interact and when and where, you know, where they're going to go to, how they're going to move through this stuff. And um, we call that stuff space-time. Um, it's a convenient way to think about it, but that's everything we do in science. Everything we do in thinking is this, right? We give words and names to things 
to help us try to keep our thoughts clear about them. So I don't, you know, may, maybe I just don't know what space is deep down, but maybe that's just because we don't know what anything is deep down. We just have words and patterns that we recognize and we just keep repeating those patterns and using them to try to make predictions and test our ideas. Uh, but I'm not sure I know what an electron is deep down. In fact, I'm sure I don't. Um, I'm not sure I know what energy is deep down. I'm certainly not sure I know what space or time are deep down. Um, I, I just think they're convenient tools to keeping track of this stuff. The space interact with anything besides time? So um, here, here's how I put that. The, the way that matter and energy are distributed in space, from that you can work out the shape or geometry of space. And once you know the shape or geometry of space, the space how to curve, how to curve. The geometry of space tells things how to move. That's the back and forth. That is Einstein's theory in a nutshell, right there. So those uh, foolish flat earthers are fooled by their senses and they see a flat horizon, and, uh, and yet we all know we're on a globe. But are we facing that similar scenario when we're looking out at the universe because of the cosmic microwave background is our limit of our visible, observable universe? Is it just that we don't have a wide enough perspective to see why that curve goes almost straight up or whatever? It's just our perspective isn't big enough. Maybe. So if we point a telescope at these wavelengths in any direction of the sky, we find that we hit a wall, okay, where the CMB is, the cosmic microwave background is. We can't see through it. But we have other ways that we can see past it. Okay, maybe not with the same kind of light or even light at all. But for example, when we measure how much helium and hydrogen and deuterium and lithium and beryllium there are, that's something that formed way on the other side of that wall, but it still exists all around us today. So we can find out things on the, about the other side of the wall. Something we haven't been able to do yet, but I think will happen in the decades ahead, is uh, about a second after the Big Bang, uh, there was another background of neutrinos that were released into the universe. So whereas light was released into the universe 380,000 years after the Big Bang, neutrinos get released about one second after the Big Bang. So we can tell those neutrinos are there from their gravity, but some decades from now, we're gonna be able to measure those neutrinos directly, that neutrino background, and uh, it will be like having x-ray vision, okay? Whereas before the light, we, were, we, we could only see so far back to 380,000 years, by looking at neutrinos instead, we'll be able to see way, way, way back further. And you know, maybe some sort of hyper futuristic thing we could provide, we could produce maps of those neutrinos that are kind of analogous to that, that cosmic background map. And the amount you could learn from that would be gargantuan. It would be enormous. But that will be a very hard thing to do, but way, way in the future, hopefully. All right, maybe we should wrap it up for the night. I'm going to go back to that table with my box of books. Anybody care to come uh, purchase one? Uh, I'd be happy to sign it for you. Thanks for your attention. This has been a lot of fun for me. I like doing these sorts of things.